Good afternoon and welcome back. It's been a long day. I know many of you got up very early and some of you are working on other time zones of many hours. But we hope today we've had an opportunity to get you to be informed and educated and energized. And this panel this afternoon, we hope it will be a culmination of what the day has been like for you. My name is Andy DePaulo. I'm the Senior Associate Dean X of the School of Engineering. Um, I was uh, also the founding Executive Director of the Stanford Center for Professional Development X. I've moved to emeritus status, so now Paul Marka, who's the Executive Director, gets to deal with all the headaches around <laughs> HR, budget, and university politics. I just get to do fun things like this. So uh, today's session is designed to bring together four people that represent uh, problems that they ha have to deal with in creating the global workforce of tomorrow, particularly around continuing engineering education. And uh, as we went forward to select the panel, I wanted a cross sample of people who represented all parts of the CEE spectrum. So we have somebody here representing higher education, we have uh, somebody representing a professional association, and two people representing industry. So I'm gonna introduce them in turn so you get a sense of who they are and what they do. But first, let me make sure you are aware of the format. I'll do these introductions, then we'll have this open discussion, and I hope the panelists will not only hear questions from me, but also questions from you. With regret, we have only one hour. And we know we're going to a social event after this, and you never want to be in the way of food and drink. So we will work to end on time so we can get you off to do that. So the first panelist is Nelson. Many of you know, have known Nelson for a long time. He opened up the conference today. You know, a very serious player in continuing engineering education, and has been uh, doing that for many, many years. And I've known Nelson for a long time. A very, very skilled, competent, personal guy. So he was, he's our higher ed rep, but also represents an association, he represents IACEE. Uh, the second is Zhang Ching, who, uh, who I will call GQ, he likes to be called that, it's easier. My Chinese pronunciation is sometimes difficult, so we will call him GQ, and also has a long and distinguished uh, career involved with continuing engineering education. I've also known him for a long time, and he will bring an interesting perspective from another part of the world here into Palo Alto. The third is Tommy Moreno. And why Tommy is important to us today is he, ha he represents a number of sectors. Uh, he represents a utility. At lunch today, he told me that in the United States, one out of every 22 utility customers are customers of PG&E. So it's a very large, uh, large company. He also has worked biotech companies and, and in companies dealing with uh, finance uh, and banking, and Charles Schwab. So that's one piece of it. And then. The last is being, uh, being, and I are actually graduates of the same program, our PhDs are from Indiana, so, but we were there a different year. She's much younger than I am. And she, why I like B to come here is because if you look at her background, she has worked in both the software and the hardware side of engineering. So I think we've been able to cover the spectrum of engineering as well as professional associations and higher education. So, I have a series of questions uh, that I will ask. Now, we have one hour. I've come to the conclusion I could ask one question, that would cover the entire hour. I mean, there's so much we, we could do. So I'll start. But I also want to make sure if you have questions, that on your app, you're welcome to submit a question on the app. And Robert up front here, if you submit a question, we'll try to do some sifting and sorting so that we might then have questions that represent a broad spectrum of the audience. But also, don't worry, I'll give you a chance to raise your hand and ask a question with a microphone as well. So that's what we'll be doing for the next 55 minutes. Oh, this is me. Uh, we'll get them. So let's go ahead and start. And I'll ask a broad-based question. And that is uh, for our panelists. And there's no particular order. Anybody can jump in at any time. And the, and the big sort of big softball question, and, and that is, where do you see continuing engineering education going in the next five years in support of workforce development? So we'll just open it up to anybody who'd like to deal with that question. Tommy, please. All right. Where we see it going, actually, where if you look at the, just the PG&E, which is uh, 22,000 employees, 150-year-old company, and 55% uh, of the workforce currently qualifies for retirement. So the goal is how do you keep the infrastructure going, 150-year-old infrastructure, to bring in new talent, what we've been able to do is say, how do we teach the old to the new so they have the old structure 
working on the new. And we found that continuing education has worked marvelously because they're working on current projects, and we partner with Stanford, and they're actually taking courses that relate to PG&E, working on real projects, real time, and getting course credit. Did the same thing at Genentech, where real, real problems, real issues, real college credit. And in both cases, at Genentech, the course actually developed a new uh, syringe so that individuals would be able to give themselves uh, insulin injections. They actually implemented in class, actually worked on it, and used it as a company. At, Genent at the PG&E, we actually worked on, a, the students worked on an app on Can I Dig Here? And it was a project, they got college credit, we came up with an app, can people dig in their backyards, is there, is there power lines? In both cases, the students got one thing that they always, they, they, they treasure, is a resume enhancement. It says Stanford. They love it, their parents love it, and pg and &E got a, a, a project out of it, as Genentech did. So it's a nice combination of both, where it's real, real work, real education, and certifications. Thanks, Tommy. Okay. That's, we heard the same thing from our colleague at AT&T about yep. the same kinds of challenges. Uh, thanks. Anyone else? Yeah. Pete? Yeah. yeah, for professional education, I think the brilliant minds here will tell you better where you're taking it. But from my perspective, in the five, six years I've been at Intuit, every year is a wave change. It is a transformation in technology. One year is mobile. Next year is big data. Now it's cloud. Um, so I'm I think a critical skill set is to be able to change, to adapt. Um, that is really, really critical with the technology changing so quickly. Uh, jobs become obsolete, and people have to learn new jobs. And the new folks coming in, the new folks, we, we are trying to hire folks and can't find the right talent um, because some of new, these new technologies are so new. Can you speak a little bit about how that change occurs within Intuit? Or you, do you have formal programs on change management, or do you go out of house to that? What kinds of things do you do? Yeah, these are changes that are driven all the way from the top. I think Scott talked about it a little bit at at and In the same way at Intuit, it starts with the CEO staff. So this year, one of our big transformational changes would be, let's say, moving to the cloud. Uh, what does that mean? How does it enable our business? It's really critical. The next forum is all VPs in the company, all officers in the company get that message and understand what it means. So just in March, for instance, at a VP conference, we use Legos to teach our VPs who are mostly business people, some of them are engineering leaders, what it means to, why we need to build services rather than monolithic apps why we need to break them down into services, and we use Legos to teach them. So they get the concept there, and the change starts there at the VP level. The next forum that we have mid sometime um, in May and June is the entire engineering population. What does it mean to build services, and why do you need to know it, and what are things you need to learn? And then the next change is in the fall, we have all directors and above goes through the change. So we actually very systematically drive that change. And my program aligns with that to ensure they have the skills to execute that change. Thank you, B. Uh, Nelson, uh, GQ, uh, you, uh, either one. Yeah, what I was going to add to that, I think that change is significant. And it's certainly something that I worry about a lot. Uh, I head up, as, as most of you know, a, a training organization that provides training to industry. And yet I think uh, on the scorecard, if I gave myself a letter grade for what we do internally within the university, I'm failing. Uh, and so how do we change our own staffing capabilities and how do we grow our own people within these learning environments to be better learners and instructors and, 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 and facilitate, you know, drink our own medicine uh, kind of thing. And we're not doing very well with that. So I would say that we have to really think and take cards from industry and other industry segments of how they've been able to reformulate their own businesses and do the same thing for ourselves. The last part that I would uh, add to that uh, is I think collaboration is going to be key, but part of this also comes to policy and regulatory activities. And each of us in different jurisdictions and different countries have uh, different limitations perhaps. Uh, but some of the policies that we're dealing with are fairly outdated for what we're trying to, to do in terms of working together. And collectively, we're going to have to put some uh, public pressure to make those things uh, be modified if we're going to succeed. 
Yes, uh, there are several surveys in China labor market. In the next 20 years, the needs of workforce is quite changed. So they need more engineers on 3Gs and uh, uh, new materials and uh, flight design and this kind of things. So that means all the curriculum in the universities of in your education must be changed to fit the needs of employment in the next uh, 10 or 20 years. So following that, there is a very big national program on outstanding engineering engineers, not engineering, but engineers education program, which is a part of talent development of Chinese national program, which is started from year 2010 to year 2020. So in this program, they need quite change, quite big change of the curriculum in the universities and also in the different departments, they will review the curriculum, which is fit to the labor market request in the following years. So that means these changes need more involvement of industry to the curriculum development of universities and colleges. And the second one, all the teachers, especially engineer teachers, they should have more industry knowledge. So this kind of balance, they must be uh, request all the, especially the, the, the leaders of education, of higher education, to rethinking your program and your curriculum, which will be find some ways to have some new knowledge and new skills to be fit in these programs for your uh, student development and for the engineers in the future. So that means if you don't change, the problem will, will be happen for the employment. The students after graduation, you cannot easily find the jobs mm. in the labor market, so will, more risk will happen for unemployed. So that is uh, the most situation for this kind of change. Thank you. V and I were talking this morning, and we, we actually came across what I would regard as a dilemma. And the, the dilemma is this, is most of the people in this room are on the higher ed or the provider side. And the difficulty oftentimes is that we try to discern from industry what their needs are, translate that, and have our faculty members do something about it. The, the challenge that I faced all the time is you go back to the faculty member and he or she says, no, that's not what they need. They need this. So there's this, this lack of being synchronized between higher ed's needs and what universities can provide and how they can move. Universities are slow to change, but how they might move quickly to do that. So Nelson had a program, the program you did with AT&T. I'll ask a question for you. How can universities and industry better understand needs and how to provision for those needs? So I'll go ahead and, and take a start first. And I think the biggest challenge from my perspective is trying to speak a common language. I think many times we're talking around the same concept or circles, but we're using different words from the context from which we come. And trying to break that down into what really is needed is critical. And then secondly, understanding the constraints from both sides. The speed at which uh, universities tend to move is a far different speed than what industries tend to move. And historically, those have been for great reasons. But there has to be the beginnings of some type of compromise. Uh, the program that we did with AT&T has set land speed records for higher education approval processes, at least within the state of Georgia, that from the time of the first conversation to the launch of the course was 19 months. Uh, and that's through all the governmental bodies and faculty approval processes, uh, development of the curricula, and launching the program. Uh, that's fast by our standards. Uh, that's very slow for industry standards. So how do we find those kinds of matches? Yes, I quite agree with uh, Nelson. I don't think that it's easy to find out the way, the right way for the involvement of industry for ed education, engineering education in the universities. There is still a lot of problem now in the Chinese uh, education for engineering. After four years, when they go to the factory or they go to the companies, they still need some time for retraining. They need some, a lot of cost for the students, 
for the graduates to understand what are, uh, what are you going to do for your job. So that means if we have talked about the more involvement of industry, there will be, should be have the kind of mechanism, regularly involvement of industry to talk about, have discussion and have curriculum development with the teachers of the universities. So that way will be very important. And even a lot of discussion online with the industry and teachers in the universities, it could change what happened in the, in the industry, what the new changes for that. So the teachers, the curriculum developers in the universities, they can quickly understand what happened in the industry. That'd be more effective for that to find the solutions of that. An excellent point because when we, the, one of the most difficult things for students is obviously from school to work and that transition to do that. So I think the, 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 the sort of resurgence of rotational programs is starting to resurface even more so because it becomes a curriculum. It's six months, I change, six months, I change, six months, I change. Because in 15 years, this room will be filled with 80% millennials because that's who's going to be in the workforce. 80% of the workforce in the next 15 years will be millennials. Uh, the rest will just be the rest of us. So with that in itself, think about how industry has to teach them for six months, new project, I get to change semesters, try something different for six months, change something, but it's adding. Because right now they want to go broad, more exploration. We need for them to go deeper, more uh, into the subject matter, especially in engineering. So we let them go broad a little bit, but then we start to uh, establish them into the engineering pool with rotations, keep their interest, keep retention high is the goal. Yeah, I, I don't think industry is trying to, you know, just throw the problem to universities and colleges to solve. We understand that when we hire someone, they're not ready to do the job that we want insight into it. Um, so for instance, we are going to the cloud. AWS is, if any of you know what Amazon Web Services is, is, is out there, right? Anybody can learn Amazon's Web Services. But in TWID, we have specific security guidelines around that. So you have to learn that when you come in. But I would love to be able to go out there and find someone who understands the new cloud <coughs> paradigm. You work differently in a cloud world. Um, you know, some of you might have heard of DevOps culture, where the developer, the quality person, IT may go away. Ops, they all work together. Um, and roles are very fuzzy in this cloud world because now you have all kinds of tools that the developer uh, could use when in the past they had to throw it over to IT to get done, um, like setting up the infrastructure. Cloud is all set up for you. So that kind of a change um, is something that we have to deal with as well. Mindset changes, um, role changes, but is that something that can be taught in the universities, um, I don't know. Um, but you know, it's going to change. Tomorrow it's not going to be the cloud, it's going to be something else. So how do we work so that we are forward looking versus looking backwards? We have to be forward looking, otherwise you'll always be catching up. What Nelson talked about change in higher ed, and that was at light speed. I remember a quote from President yeah. Franklin. 19 months is ancient, amazing. Right? Franklin uh, Roosevelt once said, there's only one thing more difficult than uh, altering a university curriculum, that's moving a graveyard. <laughs> so uh, what, uh, so that, now I give us a lot of credit for being able to pull that off and, that yeah. fast. So, and so in, in the engineering world, the other thing is the, our agile, agile development. And I don't know how many of you have heard about agile development. Um, you know, every two weeks we put out working software, right? Um, I know some companies like Amazon or Twitter they might put out 1,000 updates a day. So that's the speed of the business. Um, and so it's OK if you put out a curriculum that's half-baked, because it's OK to experiment. So that culture of experimentation and agile development could be applied to the curriculum development world as well. It doesn't have to be 19 months before you put out something. We used to wait one year before we put out TurboTax. Right, because you only need it once a year to do your taxes. But now we are constantly iterating. We are actually experimenting with you. Some of you use TurboTax. You may not know that you're using one version versus your neighbor is using another version because we are A-B testing it. So I think that kind of um, 
mindset could be applied to curriculum development. So you're not spending 19 months to put something out. Thank you. Does Robert, did you have some questions from the audience? Do you have something? Uh, yes. So many speakers have talked about the trend, the need for learning, smaller learning opportunities, certificates, uh, nano degrees. What do you see as the current and future role of credentials versus graduate degrees from a hiring and promotion standpoint? Well, what I find with the individuals we put in the certificate program, what they do like is that there's academic credit with it versus going for a certificate and getting a certificate and then starting a master's degree later. They really like, I get a certificate, done, accomplish something, and I now have units towards a master's degree at Stanford, got transcripts, done, and then the goal is for them to enroll. So it's, it's starting, finishing something, starting and finishing versus, and the academic credit does look, it's building their resume. It's who they are. So the more credentials uh, with known names, the, the better it is for them. And their parents love it, that we're paying the tuition for them. So it's nice. Mm -hmm. From the business perspective, um, if it tells me that you know something, that's good. But um, it's, certifications are almost to my engineering population old school. Um, badges, they're excited about badges for some reason. I'm not an engineer, I don't know why. Um, ninja badges for, you know, <laughs> having done something. That seems to resonate with them more than certificates, uh, certification uh, these days. Um, but as for, for hiring managers, it's an indication that they, they have accomplished something. But in the interview, they're going to be drilled, right? On whether they actually know what they're talking about. Any comments? Yes, uh, in China, the certification accreditation for the different uh, uh, study on the job or after graduation, if retraining and, but the people think which have more value of the certificate. If the enterprises run a kind of institutions or training centers, they don't think that is have very uh, uh, real value for they get a promotion, for technically uh, promoted from engineer, from technicians to engineers and that. So a lot of companies, they spend a lot of money to send their employees to get some certificate in the uni universities for a period, maybe six months, or maybe uh, some uh, only on the uh, weekends to join the courses. So that means those kind of certificate is compared with those from the schools, there's still some difference. Dif uh, differences for that. So if uh, this uh, assessment or appraisal for the different uh, certificate or that is still uh, something for, for people to think, especially for the companies, how to get more effective uh, money spending for this kind of uh, upgrading of their knowledge for these different uh, certificates. And I guess I'd just add one other point to this, and I think that's where we in higher education or in the provider market need to be listening more uh, to what are the needs of our learners and of our stakeholders uh, in this space. Uh, although part of me wants to say, and I, I will say, at some point you have to have a base level of knowledge to which to add those other kinds of credentials, whatever form they are, and how do we define that base level? Is it an associate degree? Is it a high school degree? Is it four years of boot camp? I, we got to figure that part out. What's the place from which we start then to add these other kinds of uh, smaller unit increments uh, to build upon? Uh, but I don't think we can begin that, and I'll extend this uh, in, a, in a weird direction. You, you can't start a kindergarten and expect somebody to, to have core competencies to work in the workplace. So at some point, the formal education process has to go along in some fashion, and then we can branch off. Where that point is, I think, is changing. It, just to add to that, also it's which age group. Right out of college, we get 100% enrollment in the certificate. It's voluntary, they don't have to because it's the academic credential. Older, zero. It's they're working off of experience, so it's still those who are in the academic mode want more education and continuing. I've seen in, in working with some companies where there's been recognition and acknowledgement for doing something in, in an academic program or a certificate program where the people who are pushing forward 
and have a proven set of competencies, they're then rewarded. They get fast tech for promotion, or they get a salary increase, or some bonus or something. So there is, there is some roadmap, perhaps, that's being uh, put out for them to follow, and then the company recognizes that. So uh, you're still adding questions to Robert. Use your app to do that. I think, Robert, you have another one you, you, you've collected or summarized? Yes. Um, so there tends to be this tension between training and education and finding the right mix. In your opinion, how do you foster that communication to start understanding that problem? Uh, yes, education and training, there's really a big debate uh, in the different countries. Uh, some uh, staff in education think uh, uh, training is not a formal education system. So they're against some uh, input for the companies or for the enterprises to put money for the training. There are quite debates in China several years ago between the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of, of Labor. They think about different ideas, how to promote. And after that, education, Ministry of Education, they think we should emphasize, they call it vocation education. But they still will use education. It's not kind of training. But for the labor side, they, they should strengthening for the training for the skilled workers. After this, from the uh, skilled worker school, they have some. So there's uh, a lot of debate for that uh, kind of thing. It's really consuming a lot of energy between these two uh, different systems. So that, now we need a lot of uh, coherence between these two systems together to find out some good policies to support this uh, continuing engineering education, no matter if it's uh, technicians or workers or engineers, they should add one system together. So I would add to that, um, I don't see it as an or, I see it as an and. You need both. Uh, you need some type of formal process that goes along and maybe we call that education, <coughs> but you have to be able to do something uh, and so uh, perhaps that's more of the training side, but I see it as a continuum. And throughout one's life and your, your various stage in life, you're going to slide back and forth between this continuum of what it is that you need and what it is that your employer needs of you. Uh, and so for me, it's an and. It's not uh, this or that. It's both. Do you, do you uh, see education as preparing someone more broadly for a career we potentially, you know, different in different areas, whereas training is very job specific. Is that how you guys see it? Because I, I know I do training. I don't do education, but I'm sure you guys do education, right? You provide a more well-rounded person, whereas I am focused on meeting the company's goals of moving to the cloud in the next year or so, let's say. Um, and I'm very focused on training them to be able to do that. Let me ask a question to the audience. How many of you deliver, and I'll parse it between education and training, how many of you are education deliverers, providers? How many here? Most. How, how many are training providers? About a third. So there's some mix of both in here. And I think certain universities will focus on providing training. What somebody once asked me, what's the difference between education and training? And uh, it, just envision if you have a 13-year-old daughter in middle school, do you want to have sex education or sex training? <laughs> That's a big <laughs> Robert, <laughs> do we, do we have, do you have another question? No, it's, better, it's better to use sex education, it's not to use sex <laughs> I, I agree. As, as anyone who is a parent here will also agree to that. That's correct. Good. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about graduating students and early career workforce and their challenges in the uh, fast-paced changing world. Um, in your opinion, what should be done for the older working professionals and how do you keep them up to date as they phase out in the next 20 years? Yeah, uh, there's a very, very big movement of the 1990s in China which is restructuring the state-owned enterprises. After that, there's quite old workers has lost their job because there are a lot of 
restructuring of the factories, so a lot of old workers will be uh, laid off. So they, they meet very difficulties because they have no new knowledge, they have new skills, they meet a lot of difficulties during their daily job. So those kind of delayed, the laid off workers, those, uh, of course, after that they have some uh, policies to support those difficult laid off workers to find some simple jobs for them to do, especially those uh, after 40 to 50, that period of uh, years of workers. They need more, uh, find new jobs and a lot of training programs and find some simple uh, posts for them to do. So that is uh, something happened in the and last Does the year. government support the development of those programs and offer those or the yes. individual companies do that? The government request some companies to hire more laid off workers. And also they have some, a lot of public uh, enterprises, public jobs, for, uh, such as cleaning and uh, different jobs for those laid off workers. What we've actually done with such an older workforce is uh, we've implemented just recently that if you're over 55 years of age, you can go on a reduced work schedule, three days a week, four days a week, whatever it might be, but your job along with is to develop the new talent the 20 year old engineer that's coming in, the, the recent graduate, whatever it might be, it's how do you get these people up to speed and you got two years and at the end of those two years then you do retire, or do leave the company. So it's, this work, it's a workforce that is ready to move out, they need the new, but they're just not moving out. So how do you keep it current is there's no incentives to leave the company, but at the same time not take all the knowledge with you and do, you know, uh, collect the knowledge with somebody else who's going to be entering the workforce. Tolerance is not a function of age. It's a function of are you keeping up to date with your, with your technical skills. You know, we have older employees who are super because they're constantly keeping themselves up to date. Um, so that is key. And we help them by providing the right training. We do allow them. We have tuition reimbursement. We allow people to go out and take a second degree, whatever they, they need um, to keep themselves up to date. Cost is not an issue. It's, it's you know, making sure that you are keeping up to date. And I'll add just one more point from inside the university perspective, and I constantly talk about this at my own university. Once we start talking about students across all demographics as opposed to just the traditional then we know we made it. The question I have, and, and I look uh, at Tommy and B, these are the people who pay for the tuition and fees for students who take courses with us from, from companies. I'm, I'm curious, from both sides of that equation, have, can you point to a success story of working with the university and what you learned from that? Or the more interesting question, can you point to a failure in what you learned from that? Anything that, where you've seen something has worked well for your company working with the university or not? I think what's not worked well is we moved too slow to implement it because we went with really small numbers of people. Just today we're talking about now IT because of the fact that the competition for IT workers and for them to go into a utility company which only 4% of every graduating senior in 2013 says they're going to a utility company. All the rest are going somewhere else. So it's very competitive and want to go to software companies. So the goal is how do we now go bigger and the goal is instead of going with uh, teens, we're looking at going how to go to 50 people, 100 people, 200 people per year in these programs to get them up to speed to get very current. So I think our lack of moving fast enough uh, has held us back because we're now behind and we'll continue to be behind unless we go to bigger numbers. So we need big and I think that was one. And it's costly, but at the same time though, it's more so not to do it for us. Okay. Another example, uh, when I was working for a vocational teacher's college in Tianjin City, in that college there is a special program. So they have very uh, close link with the industry, with the need from industry. So the students there, they have uh, two years uh, study and one year skill training. Another year in the factory. So after the graduation, they have two certificates, two uh, diplomas. The first one is uh, graduation, another one is skills. 
uh, level one or level two steel workers. So those companies or factories, they have a request one year before for the school. So we need for the mechanics for 50. We need uh, fixers 50. So that after that they can very really easy to find jobs. 50 no 95 percent they can all have jobs. So this is very good linkage between the schools and the industries. And, and to add to that, Andy, the fact is that when they're in these programs, the retention rate skyrockets. Currently, we have 100% retention of millennials who have been in the program for a little bit over two years. And at Genentech, it was even like 95% after five years. So they would stay because academically, they're still collecting, they're still adding, they're still exploring, but they're adding uh, credentials to their resumes. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left, and so keep those questions coming. Collectively, you have a great deal of wisdom and experience here. This is a chance to really grill these folks on tough questions so that you can learn from them. Robert, we have another question. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, discussion around the generational difference between the aging workforce and the incoming millennials. Um, how does this generational difference surface globally, and what do you see across cultures? It's an excellent question. My dissertation was actually on uh, Parental influence on millennials in the workplace. And what we found was that there's, there's, there's an interesting finding. 35 is the new 24. Uh, what people did at 24, they're now doing at 35, basically career-wise. They're staying in school longer. They are not staying at a company longer. They're moving on. So what previous generations did, the new generation will keep moving until they're 35 to go deeper. Basically, they're exploring, not establishing. So the interesting part is, that yet globally, this is the first generation that's been considered to be a global generation because of technology. You can tweet and cause a revolution in, in uh, Egypt or know about it, where in the past, how long would that take? So with technology, everything's sort of off the table of what career was and what career is going to be. So it's, it, again, because of instant communication, even today in one of the sessions we're talking about team, and is there a difference in the word team itself? What does that mean? So it's massively changing but it's closer to global than ever before. We haven't addressed that specifically in our company because we embrace <coughs> diversity and age and all that is diversity. Diversity of thought, diversity of you know, gender. Um, so we don't actually highlight that. We do have these self-forming networks. They're pretty formal once they are formed, but we have an Indian network, we have a Christian network, we have a next gen network. And the millennials will come to, you know, uh, get together and they will put programs together to talk about yeah, uh, what they want from management. Um, they might get together and teach other people about new technologies they know about. So we give them a place to um, sh show their value. So they are valued just like everyone else, they're not any different. So the diversity, the culture of embracing diversity really works, I think, there. Yeah, traditionalists and boomers want respect for what they know. I built this company, I know how to do it, and I'm, gonna, I, I'm here because I know what I'm doing. Millennials want respect because they're bringing uh, new technology and knowledge. So how do the two communicate, work together, is one of HR's biggest dilemmas right now of uh, generational clashes on soon, your manager's gonna be 20 years old and you got 50, 60 year old people in the room that they're managing and vice versa. Let me also now, uh, some of you are not using the app, which is fine. So I'll ask, is there, is there any question? I have a few more questions I wanna ask, but back here. And can you say who you are, please? So my name is Patricio Montesinos. I'm from uh, the Valencia Technical University from Spain. This question is for the two persons from companies. Uh, which, if you have to choose only one competency, only one, uh, and select the competency that uh, makes you to pay a lot to someone, to, to anyone who, who gets inside the organization, uh, which competence uh, you select? Ambiguity. <laughs> ambiguity. Mm -hmm. To be able to deal with ambiguity because it's not, especially for engineers, it's not 
One, two, I mean, it's, they're used to the numbers. It's, it's a universal language. But yet, when you have a mixture of generations, is the projects are going to change, the infrastructure may change, the amount of money, in our case, the regulators, the state's going to give us to be able to run the company, or just budgets overall. So moving and having, you may not end that project. You may be pulled off that project sooner, so be able to jump to another one and be as enthusiastic as you were in that one. So dealing with the ambiguity of massive change, uh, massive differences, and in the workplace overall is one I would pick. And we actually hire for that. Agility. Someone who can pick up a new technology tomorrow uh, and not fear it. Um, someone who can change how they work with their, you know, in a new context, in a new world. Um, so that agility, that ability to adapt to change is, uh, is really critical. I, I can tell you, I mean, my number one thinking right now is cloud, cloud computing, you know, that, but that is going to change next year to something else. So that agility is really critical. Thank you for the question. There's another question. Uh, Fleming, you have a question here? Thank you. My name is Fleming Fink. I'm from... Uh, Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Aarhus University in Denmark. Uh, we've been talking um, about more, more different things at the same time, learning, education, training, etc. In my part of the world, the, the ed education is taking your degree, and taking your first degree is a personal thing you do privately, not involving a company. When you have your first degree, you'll have your first job, after you have your, when you have your first job based on your first degree, you will not talk about, in general, of course there's some, some differences, but in general, in general you will not talk about further education. You will talk about further learning. It's not important for the company that the, that the, um, the employee takes another degree, but it's, it's important that they learn what they need in the future. So therefore I think that's the way I would distinguish between continuing learning and continuing education. Continuing education is a private issue for your own uh, CV and that will not be paid by the company. So there might be some differences around the world. Um, we have not distinguished here between uh, efforts we do to big companies and small companies. We're mainly talking about the big ones. They're also the easiest one to cooperate with and set up classes and whatever. But far the majority of the industry is small and medium-sized enterprises. So I would like to, to hear a little bit about how you see the difference between SMEs and big companies in continuing learning in the future. Thank you. I've only worked for big. <laughs> <laughs> But I think one, it's interesting on the academic aspect of it because the average millennial is going to stay two years or less with a company. 66% of them are currently unhappy with their present job. So the thing is what they're going to take with them is what? I learned something from company X or I got something from Stanford. And I think they see that as a collection of what we call a badge, certificates. It's academic. It's, it's part of who I am. It's building that. Um, but I don't know about small companies. I haven't worked for any. If I'm thinking of a startup, um, we just lost someone. To, we, we lose people to startups all the time. And um, we try to sell our culture. We don't abuse you. Um, we are one of the most awesome places to work for you know, years and years. Um, but they go to startups or the startups hire them because they have that agility. They seem to be someone who can do all kind, uh, any number of things that I need. As a startup, there's no clear roles and responsibilities. You know, you just pitch in. And so they look for that person who actually is well-rounded. So, you know, output from your programs who can um, actually, you know, be doing, you know, development today and testing tomorrow and ops to the next day. So that kind of a person. I know a corporate executive board recently did a study, actually the 2014, which showed, it was a global study, 
And it showed, so what are the five EVPs, <coughs> executive value proposition? And the one difference between generations uh, was that what millennials wanted was continuous development. And what all other generations wanted was security. So I think that one difference, everything else, everybody wanted high pay, everybody wanted work-life balance, et cetera. But those are the only two differences that they found in this one study. Um, again, it's, it's Fortune 500 companies mostly that they surveyed, not the smaller ones. I think two, uh, two aspects to answer your question. The first one is about the training in the uh, companies. A lot of uh, human resources departments, HR request a kind of degree of the engineers or technicians. If you meet that condition, you maybe have some more uh, promotion or salary increase. So that gives a lot of incentive for the employees to find some opportunities to get their degrees higher. So they will get uh, a lot of benefit for their personnel. The second one for the small and mid-sized enterprises, how they organize some training programs. In some policies in China, they request all the companies or factories, they spend 2% of the wage bill for the retraining, for the continuing education for the employee. But for some small or mid-size, they don't have that kind of uh, benefits to award for this kind of request. So they need a lot of activities by the sector's organization to organize within the sectors, no matter big or small, they can get some training together or the develop different programs. Uh, I was going to say something very similar in terms of trying to find collaborations. Uh, I forget the exact statistic, but I know in the United States, the vast majority of, uh, of companies are small companies, not large companies. I have a statistic. Uh, you have the statistic. <laughs> Since okay. we are in the small business financial world, 99.7% um, of US companies are small businesses as defined by number of employees or gross revenues? Yeah. Um, so there is a definition of revenue depending on manufacturing or service industry. And um, uh, it's, it's just unbelievable. Um, the, medium, the medium number of employees is two, median. So I think 70% are proprietor, uh, sole proprietors. Imagine that. We talk about Google and you know, Intuit and Intel and AT&T, they make less than 3% of the businesses in the United States. So one of the things that we're trying to experiment with yeah. ex exactly around this is I've hired an individual uh, to try to uh, search out for those kinds of small and, and medium-sized enterprises and see if there's common themes. But then we're going to put together a learning hub and bring them together on some type of periodic basis. It's another experiment. How will it work out? I don't know yet. We're just now uh, in the beginning parts of our thinking. But we recognize that creativity has to come from the entire spectrum, not just from the large firms. And many times, it's the small firms that can be most innovative because they have less momentum, from my perspective, that I have to change. But how can we help support them? Again, we need to be out there and listening. Robert, we have another question? Uh, yes. Many references have been made to the retention benefits of providing learning opportunities to engineering employees. Is there a concern that free education like MOOCs and content aggregators will erode the retention leverage if employees can easily and cheaply learn on their own without the company's uh, support? That's a, that's a great question. Why would that impact retention? Uh, I <laughs> I, I believe that access to education and training is provided because of financial backing of the uh, company, oh. providing them, and now they're able to actually go and find free educational opportunities on the web. So I don't think uh, uh, an engineer stays with a company because they can get training through it. So I don't think that's, the, I love having that MOOC. There is a MOOC on, um, I think, uh, machine learning, um, uh, cybersecurity, the, the, those from, I think Georgia Tech has cybersecurity. These are so relevant, and I would ask my folks to go take that. 
Um, it's free, it's out there. They love it too because the quality is so high. Um, and they learn so much from that intense period. Um, I don't think that makes them think I should leave into it now since I can get training there because there are other benefits. It, it used to be, and, it, and, and one, we were talking about this, uh, this at lunch when I would go out and talk to companies. You talk to the engineering manager or the VP, and he or she would say, this is what we need for training. Then you talk with the individual engineer, and he or she saying, no, I don't want to do that. Because they're thinking of their own career. It may not be matched to what the company is doing. So this, this, yeah. this notion now of having opportunities for free training allows that individual engineer to be creative and explore whatever they want, I think. Yeah, so the beauty for us, fortunately for us, is the stuff we need them to learn is marketable skills. So a few years ago, it was mobile. Right now, everybody knows how to develop mobile apps on iPhone and, and Android mobile apps. That was such a hard skill. So it's relevant to them in their career as well as on their job. So that there's no discrepancy there. We have a few minutes left. I have, I have a final question I'll ask in a moment, but I want to make sure that we've covered. Any other questions out here from the audience? Robert, anything else that's come your way? Uh, yes, well, one last question. Um, so a lot has been talked about the benefit of continuing education for employees. Um, how do uh, your organizations or uh, the universities that provide these education, how do you measure the impact of these programs that you spend or provide? There is uh, quite some uh, year-based uh, assessment for our organization in China. We use our different members to check how many engineers you get some continuing uh, engineering uh, retraining or some uh, education program. They have very good example for, for our members of Council uh, Ball Steel. They have a regular, the impact, if we check that they need a lot of calculation, or, what impact you're talking about money, we're talking about the personnel increase, whatever. If you talk about the benefits, through five years, this training program, the benefit increased by this kind of survey or this kind of calculation. Some company did that, but that is need a lot of figures to figure out what is the impact. This year, we have 50 engineers have different trainings and different education program, and then we'll check about the benefit if there's some increase. But the impact cannot be only be judged, be evaluated in that kind of things. So they still need some, how about your culture, your company culture change or something else. So that is be a total concept for that kind of impact. I think we also found the fact that those who went through a rotational program that had an academic component to it, they not only stayed longer, they also performed better performance-wise because we compared those who did not go through the program versus those who came through the program uh, and in parallel, and they always got better performance reviews. Is it because they're watching them more? Is it because they're interacting? We don't know, but the goal is they did perform better and stayed longer with the company, both in the biotech and also now in the utility company. So new, new, new company, old company did the same. Let me move forward then to ask a, a, a final question from me. And so we have people here who represent both sides of the equation, the industry side as well as the higher ed side, the organizational side. In reflection of the work that you have done and will intend to do, if you could give one piece of advice to providers of continuing engineering education to make sure that we are doing the job that companies need or from the perspective of a university or organization, what advice from, that you can provide, what could you tell the people in this audience that they should be doing to, to survive and thrive in this marketplace? I think what's interesting is that, uh, again, back to the research, it's all, it's all based on what we're starting to do is we're not just marketing what we have to the students and to the graduates, but we're going to the parents because of the high impact that they have on their careers and the fact that even just with 300 inter 200 interns, 100 full-time hires that came to the company yesterday. Um, it was, I've never seen this, but the parents, the person comes up to the uh, security guard, gets their badge for the internship, 
20-some-year-old engineer. Mom and dad came with him to say goodbye and good luck to you in the company. <laughs> as, they, as they went through the security gates, they both turned around and waved. No embarrassment. It's the way it is. That is the workforce of the future. And this summer alone, I've collected over 100 emails from mom and dads looking for jobs for their kids. And very upset when they didn't get it, then the follow-up email, why didn't you hire them? And then the follow-up email, you hired them, but you're not paying them enough. So the goal is, how can you, so what we're doing is for parents, is we're actually going to start marketing to them on how great it is and secure it is to work for a utility company long term. So are you advising providers to market to parents of kids? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I think we need programs for the parents. <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, at the university that I teach at also, uh, one of the they have to get bigger and larger and larger rooms, they told me last week, because it's not more students, it's more parents showing up for the new, for new student orientation. So, so. so the, the piece of advice that I <laughs> was going to give, I'm trying to also live by as I hear this story, uh, but it's be open-minded to yeah. other people's context. Yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to put myself in those shoes and having five children myself, I haven't gone with any of them and maybe I should have. <laughs> And so maybe my kids all think I've let them down. Uh, a, negligent parent. a negligent parent, I don't know, but um, demand higher salary and get a commission. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, but but I think in terms of you know the amount of change and the adaptability that we've talked about here and in other sessions earlier today, what worked yesterday may not work today and certainly won't work tomorrow. So the more that we can try to keep an open mind, ask inquiring questions, try to be uh, uh, on a level where we're really understanding what the other person is saying and where they're coming from so that we have uh, good communication is going to be critical. And that's my piece of advice. Yeah, the same uh, the big tension in China, the education, graduates from universities and with the labor market, with the employment. So this year, the graduates from university in China is 7 million wow. this year. 7 million so far, according to the uh, general survey, is around, I think, 50 to 60 can find jobs. So that means around 40% of the graduates, they cannot find their jobs. So there is quite some complaint by this gentleman said, and the parents will say, what is education? What I spend four years for you, so much money we can contribute for you. You have no jobs, you still will eat for me. So the people said that those generations, those graduates, is still eating their parents. So that is a big program. So that means what is, I can alarm all these providers for the education, please, to see the market, what they need, please see the feelings of the parents, to change your curriculum as quickly as possible to meet the request of the labor market. Yeah, oh, let me ask a question. What I, I saw research where, the United States graduates about 80,000 engineers a year. China's about 600,000 a year. Is that about right, engineers per year? How much? 600,000 China, we only do about 80,000. 600,000. Yeah. Engineers? Engineers in the pipeline getting to graduate. I think that figure is at least. Wow. Yeah. At least. OK. Uh, Thank you. So um, I think running your whatever your area is running it like a business. So who are your customers and what are their needs? Um, Scott mentioned that he is one of your customers. The employers are your customers in addition to the students, right? And um, so if you're a university offering education, maybe you want to, um, your product is this graduate who is well-rounded and agile and ready to tackle any change in the industry. But if you were in a training area, maybe you know, focus on, we have the same priorities that AT&T just put up. Front end engineers, back end engineers, iOS developers, it's the same. So understand your customer and what their needs are and address their need. At the same time, we are, while you have too many engineers with no jobs, we can't find data scientists, we can't find even Java developers or uh, front-end developers, or, uh, mobile developers, we can't find them. So who's preparing them? Should you be preparing them? 
because that's where the need is or where the market is. Thank you, B. My, uh, my advice, and it's um, for university providers, I, uh, many of you know who uh, Michael Schumacher is, a Formula One race car driver who was injured in a skiing accident. Michael Schumacher once said, um, if you're not slightly out of control, you're not going fast enough. <laughs> the, the operative word is slightly, right? I mean, but <laughs> slight. So it means for us as university providers to constantly be pushing, pushing, pushing. And sometimes that's hard in a university environment. But you have the ability to be a change agent working with our faculty to make a difference in educating the global workforce of tomorrow. So join me in giving a round of applause for our <laughs>